Hey everyone, welcome back to Outpost Gray. I'm your host, Jack Scott, and every week I provide you information within cybersecurity, innovation, and technology. It is a passion of mine. So today's episode is going to be around trends, 2022 trends. Um, currently, I'm in graduate school, and one of the assignments that I was fortunate to do was to create a presentation around what I saw for the future trends of 2022. And I love doing these types of assignments. Today, what I'm going to be talking to you about are some of the trends that I have seen really within the federal government and the directions that we're going to be going within critical infrastructure and supply chain. Now, you'll see on one of the slides, uh, I will have a little bullet point about DOD car and dot gov car now those are two frameworks that fall under CISA, and i will be discussing those in a later episode so stay tuned for that and a friendly reminder if you haven't done so already go ahead and hit that subscribe button make sure to like and share this video and thank you to all my continued supporters and my viewers i'm so gracious to have you so let's go ahead and get into this episode I'm going to discuss some um, cybersecurity trends, what I have been seeing in the industry within the last couple of years to where we are today. And then that's going to lead us into talking about what I'm seeing for the emergence, emerging governance trends. And then I'm going to provide you my final thoughts. So I felt that it was really important to initially take a step back and review some of the recent occurrences in the world in the past two years that have really impacted where we are both in security and compliance. The pandemic, it has changed the threatscape. It has done so by expanding the threatscape into our homes. The first bullet point, remote work. It's never going away. If anything, the threatscape in work remote is only going to expand, therefore giving our adversaries a larger footprint to be able to target and attack. Also, we're seeing emerging technology coming into our space, and it's created more IoT devices with a global projection of devices around 75 billion by 2025. I'm going to let that sink in. Globally, 75 billion IoT devices by 2025. Today, we're only around 30 billion. So as somebody that's been a cyber threat analyst for many years of her life, when I hear this number, what I think of is 75 billion vectors that the adversary is going to be able to attack. And I felt it was very important that the next bullet be the rise of ransomware. So we've got more vectors and we have a rise of ransomware and we are seeing ransomware as a service, for example, and it's not going away. If anything, the adversaries are going to get smarter, how they're going to leverage ransomware and their techniques, tactics and procedures are going to adjust and change as the emerging technologies come out into the space, as our threatscape increases and becomes larger for them to attack. The next thing we're gonna see is the increased cloud services. So what this is doing is now shifting those legacy enterprise systems into cloud environments. We're seeing more than just AWS and Azure. We're seeing individuals launching their own internet service providers, ISPs, into their own cloud spaces. Who is to say how secure their cloud is. And it, it's only going to be a matter of time when a cloud service provider is impacted by malware and then having it spread to other vendors that are associated with that same cloud environment. Another thing is the data privacy as a discipline. And this is a discipline in the determination of an organization deciding on what data they will or will not share with a third party. And why this is so critical and why this is becoming a discipline is, and we're seeing it through the third party assessments, third party audits. So organizations are now starting to make sure that they audit third party vendors of their risk management, compliance frameworks, things like that to ensure how secure, and we all know that compliance is not security, but it's, our, it's what we have for at least some framework to know are they doing the necessary measures to make sure they're secure? 
such as, and we see this as the next two bullets, multi-factor authentication and password management. And these two things alone can decrease the likelihood of being breached by nearly 90%. And we've seen that because a lot of breaches happen because either a phishing, phishing technique, you know, either through a text message, a voice, or email, and a user clicks on it, or it's a weak password. And a lot of these can be avoided by using multi-factor authentication and password management. So these are starting to become mandatory in organizations, also mandatory to have before you can even get cybersecurity insurance by an underwriter. And then lastly, we're gonna start seeing, and we're already seeing it, more compliance measures and more GRC requirements with organizations in certain, certain sectors. And we'll dive into a little bit of that as we go through this presentation. So you're an expert and you know it, but you keep hearing people on social media claiming to be experts in your field. Do you wish that you could distinguish yourself from them and maybe even monetize your expertise? Then be part of the revolutionized expertise app called OWL. Get instant one-on-one -on -one answers with professionals in your chosen field instantly through the app. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you been in the middle of a project just to be stumped by a problem where you couldn't figure out the answer to? Next, you find yourself conducting hours of research only to leave you unsatisfied with the results. Not without, connect immediately with professionals and get answers to your questions so you can move on with your life. On OWL, you'll have the power. Choose your experts according to your preferences. Filter them based on their rating, cost per call, or the expertise that you're specifically seeking. When you follow your favorites on OWL, you're notified immediately when they come on the app, allowing you first access to contact them. With OWL, you'll get on-demand advice by experts who have been fully vetted, allowing you to rest assured that you'll be talking to leading experts in that specific field. I encourage you to join OWL today and let's chat. Message me to get first access to this app. I wanted to focus on three particular governance trends. Now, this is not all inclusive because we don't have all day, but I want to at least cover the high level of what I'm seeing in this space to be the top three most important things within the, the governance trend space. The number one thing that I've really noticed is the increased federal involvement. And unless you have not been paying attention to the news, you've also seen this as well. Some of the things that we've seen is just in October of this year, we saw the Senate committee passing major FISMA changes, including new definition of what a major incident is. Now, this, this push really aligns with the focus from the most recent executive order that came out in May that discussed, if you remember it, it discussed a 72-hour reporting time for incidences. I think it was about, they said, three days inside of the executive order. Well, that created a lot of tension in the cybersecurity community, especially in the defense industrial base, because there, wasn't, there was no clarity on explaining what is a major incident. And all of you, if you're hearing this, three days is not very long. It takes a lot longer to be able to review an incident, verify it before wanting to just submit that, hey, CISA, we have an incident. It's been only 24 hours. We don't know much more information. So what they're trying to do, are, uh, the federal government is trying to identify, okay, what is a major incident? Another thing that we saw just recently within the last few months was uh, congressional leaders were coming forward and they were starting to make cybersecurity one of the primary points as part of their campaign and their initiatives. And one of the things that was starting to happen a few months ago was new laws trying to be amended into the NDAA to address having an incident to be reported within 24 to 72 hours. And these would be reported up to CISA. Now, they did not make it into the NDAA this year, but I would not be surprised if we saw it impact and become a law by next year. So it's something to definitely pay attention to. We're also seeing a talk about imposing fines on organizations that work in the defense industrial base. So these are DOD contracting companies. The Department of Justice was pushing this out a few months ago to try to start laying hefty fines on organizations. Some of the laws they were going to try to utilize to enforce these hefty fines was the False Claims Act. Now, the cases that have come forward utilizing the False Claims Act so far have fallen short 
of prosecution because there's a lot of wiggle room with inside of the False Claims Act. And one of the things that they really can't get around is in the False Claims Act, it states that the individual has to basically lie that they knew they were not compliant, but on their compliancy checklist, they said, yes, we're compliant, we're good to go. So it's very hard to say that a CEO or the CISO was lying, that they checked that they were compliant, not knowing that they were not compliant. So a lot of the False Claims Act have fallen short of being prosecuted. So another thing they're trying to leverage is the Whistleblower Act. And what this is, is an individual works for an organization that works in the defense industrial base, comes forward with supporting evidence to state um, this company is knowingly lying about their compliancy, and here is the information. But even some of the whistleblowers, there's one case in particular, the individual came forward about a known vulnerability in a software, but the contract agreement between the software company and the organization had a lot of gray area, and the case fell short. So where congressional leaders are going now is they're starting to, they're going to create a new law. It's going to happen. It's something that you definitely need to be paying attention to. The next thing is critical infrastructure. We've he heard a lot about this lately, and a lot of it has to do with solar winds, the impact of solar winds. Uh, we, we had colonial pipelines, the attack that happened there. So this is definitely heightened, but it's not a new thing. In February of 2013, an executive order came out and it was for improving critical infrastructure of cybersecurity. A few years later, we saw the following executive order come out, which was strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. And then just this year alone, in July, we saw a memo come out for the National Security Memo on improving cybersecurity critical infrastructure. We can see that the current presidency is extremely focused on supply chain and critical infrastructure, and many, many congressional leaders are finally forward leaning to pass more laws to enforce more security, supporting our national security and securing our critical infrastructures. Next and finally, number three is supply chain. And I left this for last because it's something I want to cover in a little bit more depth on this slide and the next slide, because this is a big area of contention right now. Uh, we saw in February of just this year, President Biden published the executive order, America's Supply Chain. And then shortly after that, he set up the Supply Chain Disruption Task Force, which was set up in June. It was designed to address near-term supply chain challenges with focus on alleviating bottlenecks and supply constraints in the transportation sector, uh, particularly for ports, railing, and trucking. But if we, if you've been watching the news, there was still a lot of challenges with the supply chain, and there's still like the microchip for the vehicles. There's a lot of things that are still happening, and the supply chain challenges that we're having right now are not going to go away anytime soon. And this is going to be a problem we're going to see within the next one to two years that lawmakers are having to act fast on and be decisive on how they want to address this. One of the things that have happened just in the last year and a half was the CMMC AB, which was the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Accreditation Body, which was which is a nonprofit that was founded to secure America's supply chain by enforcing compliance through a certification process specifically targeted for individual organizations that work in the defense industrial base and that hold information called CUI data, which is controlled unclassified information. So the purpose of the CMMC AB was to create a standardization on what to how to identify what CUI data was, how to secure it properly, and then how to do an accreditation process and an evaluation, which is very, very robust for these organizations to really, truly validate that their self-attestation is actually correct, not trying to self-assess when they're not compliant. Therefore, going back to a law that will either do hefty fines or prosecution of these organizations that are falsifying their compliance within the defense industrial base. Some other initiatives that I wanted to cover with you briefly that I felt were very important um, because these are going to impact a government space within the next one to two years. 
From the top left, we've got the Information and Communications Technology Supply Chain Risk Management Task Force. This is a subset of CISA, and it, it was developed to create that public-private supply chain risk management partnership, something that we've been needing for a while. Uh, you saw it within the executive order that came out in May, talking about the need for better data sharing and in joint environments, and that's what this initiative is attempting to do. And so far, it's been going well. Also, the 5G strategy. This is falling under NISA for a way to build the 5G security and resilience right now from the start to help reduce vulnerabilities and risk associated with rolling out 5G within the DoD space. We also have the President's National Security Telecommunication Advisory Committee. And this committee, again, is a subset of CISA. CISA Spare has a lot of these initiatives. And it was designed to get experts into a room to help provide industrial advice in telecommunication services, really with the hopes to avoid another Huawei. The next is the Department of State Clean Network Program. This was initiated during the Trump administration and was designed to create a safeguard for national assets, citizens privacy and company PI. And then finally, the Cyber Supply Chain Risk Management the CSCRM program. This is under NIST. This works together with NIST. It focuses on information security and supply chain risk management. Closing thoughts that I want to leave you with. The number one thing is federal involvement. This is not going to go away. And as cybersecurity professionals, I highly encourage each of us to start stepping forward and working with our congressional leaders working with our federal partners to assist them with creating a more secure infrastructure and finding creative ways and creative solutions on securing our supply chain, securing our critical assets within our country. If we don't do that, we're going to see more and more federal involvement and our hands will be forced to do it through new laws and new bills. Next is becoming more secure. The threatscape is expanding. It's never going to shrink. And it is our responsibilities to find creative solutions on how we can better secure ourselves. And one of those approaches is going to the basics using multi-factor authentication and password management, but then also looking at our third-party vendors and creating assessments to evaluate those third parties to ensure that they're compliant and they're secure within their environment before adding them to yours. And then lastly is CISA. Uh, CISA came out in 2018. I believe that the director today is doing some amazing things within the organization. And I believe that CISA will likely take more of an active and leading role of reporting incidences and collaborating with response teams. And we're gonna start seeing CISA push forward more to the front to help us kind of as that Northern star to become more compliant and also more secure to secure our critical infrastructures. Hey everyone, thank you again for tuning in. I know that you had to have learned something from this presentation. So go ahead, leave comments, share this with others. And as always, make sure that you subscribe. And I am so grateful for your continued support and I will see you next week.